Good afternoon. I am going to call to order this regular meeting of the Intergovernmental Relations Committee for Wednesday, June 5th, 2019. My name is Andrea Jenkins and I am the Vice Chair of this committee. Chair Johnson is absent today and with me at the dais are Council President Bender, Council Member Reich, and Schrader. Uh, let the record reflect that we do have a quorum. And so today uh, we have two discussion items on our agenda, and we will actually begin with item number two, which is the state capital investment bill. And I would invite up um, Mr. Ranieri to introduce that presentation. Madam Chair, thank you Welcome. very much. Um, my name is Gene Ranieri. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the city. Uh, today is the start of the process uh, for the submission of applications for projects for the 2020 capital bonding, bonding budget bill, which will be uh, the governor's recommendation, and then the bill will hopefully work its way through the process and be approved sometime in May of 2020. State law requires local governments and state governments, state government agencies, to put proposals together and get them to the governor and for local governments by the middle of June, and this year it's June 14th, mm -hmm. and uh, for the state a little later. You can submit a little later uh, on projects, but that, by, but however, uh, it won't be on the list that would be sent to the legislature in July, and that list in July becomes the basis for tours and visits. As you well aware, we do a visit with the park board and the county, uh, and sometimes with the University of Minnesota all in one day. Mm -hmm. So once we hear that date, we'll let you know because it's good to have you on the tour and on the bus with us. Today we have three projects that we'd like to present to you. They are all on our list now, but there are some updates to be done. The first one has been modified because it's more of the uh, performance center at the Upper Harbor Terminal. The second is the storm tunnel, and the third one is the uh, Fire Training Center, Operations Center uh, up in the uh, northeast part of our city, or frankly in Fridley. And there's one item that's on there that we'd like to withdraw, and that was the discussion of the uh, Police Wellness and Training Center. That was number four. That is not yet ready. We could bring that back later. So I would recommend that we take that off the list for now and also remove it from the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Ranieri. Um, so are there presentations? Um, Associated. Yep, and the first presentation will come, come, be done by Mr. Eric Hansen from CPED talking about the Upper Harbor. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Hansen. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Eric Hansen. I'm the Director of Economic Policy and Development for the City of Minneapolis. And before you is a request for $20 million in state bonding um, or application for state bonding for the outdoor music performance venue associated with the Upper Harbor Redevelopment Project. Um, in North Minneapolis. The Upper Harbor is a 48-acre city-owned site that the City Council and Mayor approved a uh, concept plan in March of this year. And at the center of that plan, um, uh, one of the main components of that plan in the first phase is an outdoor music performance venue. This outdoor, outdoor music performance venue uh, is the destination location that the, uh, the, uh, the development um, team has been working on, and the development team is made up of the United Properties as our lead developer, uh, working together with First Avenue Productions, and First Avenue Productions would be the operator and owner of the facility. Um, the city would have a long-term real estate interest in um, this facility per uh, our typical um, work with other cultural institutions like the Guthrie and the McPhail and, and, and Orchestra Hall and the sh um, the Cole Center. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of some illustrations just to remind you of the, um, the type of density and development we want to see. This is an extension of the McKinley neighborhood in North Minneapolis. For those unfamiliar, uh, the access point to this at this point is off of Dowling Avenue off of Interstate 94. Um, but the, uh, the concept around the development of this project is to integrate the neighborhood, uh, of McKinley neighborhood with, with this site and provide access to the Mississippi River and to, to provide some destination opportunities, which the outdoor music performance venue is um, seen in the, the top right-hand corner of the screen. 
we have a few ideas of what this um, this performance venue can look like, and then we're going to talk about one of them specifically because it's related to the bonding request. What you see here is a, um, a landform idea. The concept plan require, or sets a 7,000 to 10,000 person venue that would be located at the end of Dowling Avenue next to Dowling Plaza Park. Uh, there would be a facility with an outer lawn. I'm sorry, skipped over the slide with the phase one development. Um, as you see the orange, under the purple oval, you see under the orange is the um, performance venue. And to the right, the hashed green, um, you'll see is the, that's the outer lawn. The facility is um, proposed to be t have ticketed events for 50 days a year. For the rest of the remainder, you'll be open for community um, and community events. And depending on the, the uh, structure that is built, um, there'll be access to this area, but most, most of the time will be that outer lawn. And that's important when we talk about the finances. Uh, this is another concept that we're floating around, and this is something that we uh, showed the council when the concept plan was um, was approved in in March. And then I want to show the, uh, highlight this community performing arts idea. This is a forty million a forty two million dollar uh, facility. Uh, it has a, a gantry, which is a fancy term for an elevated walkway to watch the performances. This would. Um, be the the development team believes this is be the most impactful design, and this is the design that we are trying to uh, fundraise for. Um, this would be a year-round facility. You see some illustrations of what it could look like in the winter, where the um, the main stage could be closed off for uh, for activities uh, throughout the year. Considering we have winter sometimes here in Minnesota. Excuse me, Mr. Hansen. Can you go back a couple of slides? I just noticed. Those domed structures um, in the drawings, renderings, does that mean that the mushroom guy will be staying uh, in this proposal? Uh, Madam Chair, those, those domes are uh, what we call the relics. Uh, they're existing now, and they were for bulk storage. Mm -hmm. the, f the, the warehouse facility that uh, Mississippi Mushrooms occupies uh, about 10% of right now mm -hmm. is under a cost benefit analysis. We were reporting back to the city council about that cost benefit analysis um, back in, in July. So let me show you a map of the site again. So if you see number 13 just to the left of the purple oval, that green park, which mm -hmm. we are calling Relics Park because we're not very creative yet about the name, mm -hmm. that is where the location of the existing warehouse resides. And so um, the idea around um, uh, saving this would have an impact to the design and the concept. If you go further to the south, because it's the north is to the right of this image, you'll see an orange um, polygon with the number six, and that is a community hub, and we're hopeful that we can find space in that facility for uh, Mississippi mushrooms if they're interested in staying on the site. But that's a food-based, ecologically-based, community-owned facility. We are not sure exactly what that is because we're still working on the engagement with the community about what that concept would be. Uh, and we'll have that uh, information for you later this summer with an update, probably in the fall. But a, the coordinated plan would come to the City Council in uh, March of 2020. So, so you're suggesting that that this food production uh, hub hub would in, be incorporated into the community space. The community hub is intended to have is intended to be a facility. There's multiple things that could be in the community hub, mm -hmm. and it's not been determined. But um, uh, it is a facility that's envisioned um, uh, community-based uh, ownership that has food-based or ecological-based businesses and business activity, which Mississippi Mushrooms would um, meet you know, the general de definition. We haven't gotten to the details. Okay. Uh, but we're still in the what does it mean, and, and we're um, expecting to have that conversation with the community uh, in uh, the near future. And I will get to that in a second or a few want me to talk about it now? No, right. thank you. Okay. 
So just a few, I'll go over quickly. Here's a, here's what it looks like. I'd say uh, one of the ticketed events. We're expecting um, it to be a rock in place uh, that uh, will be both uh, uh, asset to the neighborhood, uh, the north side, the city of Minneapolis, but also the region. Um, and then back to the community engagement. So the, the city council is very clear about the direction for the next phase of planning. And in that direction, um, you gave us a, a community collaborative planning committee, a 17 member group of uh, community stakeholders to help us with this next level of design. That's why I'm kind of toe tapping around what the definitions of these um, elements are because we haven't made decisions. Uh, because we'll be doing that over the summer. We'll be starting in July with a full um, uh, engagement and um, collaboration with community. The planning committee will actually start uh, meeting in late June. Um, and this is a collaborative effort with uh, the Minneapolis Park Board, the developers, um, and the city. And on to the request. So this is a $42 million estimated cost. We're asking for $20 million um, in the 2020 budget package for the city's request. As you recall, um, the city council approved a $2 million for preliminary planning and without the budget, uh, without the bonding bill being passed by the legislature this year, we've rolled that $2 million into the anticipated 18 million for 2020 and that's why it's up to $20 million. You'll see in the sources, private fundraising, private debt, new markets, tax credits would be the non-state sources to, um, to fund this. I brought up that outside lawn you see at the bottom of the screen, the cost for the, for the relics rehab, rehabilitation and then um, some improvements on the outside lawn where there would be, again, some additional uh, philanthropic fundraising um, and other private debt. So uh, from this standpoint, we think it's a, it's a good balance where we want the, uh, to support the development team um, and uh, this uh, community performing arts center concept uh, to see how well it's uh, received with uh, the state legislature. Uh, to see if we can get this this facility so that we can have a, uh, an iconic uh, element at the center of the development here. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Are there any questions? Yes, I'm curious, you mentioned relics rehab, so we would rehab those facilities and then what would they be used for? Madam Chair, we'd like to stabilize them and use them for something. So if you have some good ideas, please pass them our way. But we're looking for um, some sort of active use for them. Uh, a number of the relics will be used as the back of the house for the, perform the outdoor music performance venue. Uh, but those big domes, we're not exactly sure what, what we would be doing, so. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Madam Chair, the next presentation will be by uh, Public Works Director Robin Han Robin, excuse me, Robin uh, Hutchinson. Thank you. It's been a long day or a long week. Uh, Robin Hutchinson uh, talking about the uh, Central City Storm Tunnel, which was in our proposal last year and may have been in the bonding bill this year, but there was no bonding bill. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Robin Hutchison. I'm the Director of Public Works. As I uh, understand that brevity will uh, help this committee move along, I will um, seek to be brief about it, especially since many of you have been in, have been in the tunnel, tunnels and you have heard this information before. Um, our storm tunnels downtown, it's a 16-mile network. They all drain into the Central City Storm Tunnel. It's shown here uh, on Washington Avenue South, that's our largest tunnel. Um, and we, because it drains so much of downtown and so much of the city, um, it is the area where we have the most issues. It is also extremely visible and serves um, a good portion of our commercial and businesses downtown. Uh, this is just a sampling of the buildings served by the Central City Tunnel System and the, and the Central City Tunnel itself which is in the Washington Avenue corridor. This is really part of a bigger system in the city. It functions in concert with 556 miles of stormwater pipe, 25,000 catch basins, 25 pump, 
pump stations, 400 outfalls, and 16 detention and water quality ponds, as well as 150 grit chambers to help protect. The real goal is to protect human health and the environment. You hear from us often about the challenges of having an aging system. Like much of our other underground infrastructure, this storm tunnel network is aging. It's very old. Um, some of these tunnels date back to the 1800s. A majority were, were built in the 1930s. They were constructed to facilitate drainage in a different era. Uh, but with growth and development and the addition of acres and acres of impervious service, surfaces, we now have a much greater need to convey this water. The problem is that they are overpressurized. These were built for much less runoff. Um, and it causes deterior, deterior, deterioration within the tunnel. And this is just simply hydraulic overloading. So increased runoff, more impervious surface, as well as a changing climate in, is increasing the pressure within the tunnels. And that leads to tunnels that crack because they are simply over capacity and over pressurized. So too many of our tunnels are in this physical situation where the concrete tunnel liners have cracked, water is forced out of the cracks under high pressure, and the water actually pulverizes the surrounding sandstones. It creates voids outside of the tunnel, and it actually deposits fine sand into the tunnel, thereby further reducing the capacity of the tunnel to do its job. Um, some green spots here show uh, the, this is our televising, we talk about our televising often, this is a tunnel that we've televised, and we can see in those green spots where the uh, pressurized water has actually infiltrated the outside of the tunnel. And so there are cracks here, and there is water seeping through, creating that void, and depositing that fine sand. So no, this is not downtown, but I did want to include this because it's captured at a manhole at 25th Avenue and Southeast. This is what happens with over-pressurization of the tunnels. Um, you've all seen manholes that have been popped off. Occasionally we have a situation like this, um, and we really do need to increase the capacity of our storm tunnel system by building a parallel tunnel. So a couple of examples here. This is very real for us. Um, this happened downtown under Hennepin Avenue. Pressurized water jetted sandstone bedrock outside of the liner, as I described. Um, the sediment traveled back through the cracks, resulting in a foot and a half of sand deposit that's shown on the, the left-hand side of the screen. Um, the sediment was washed into the Mississippi River. That's a situation we don't want. And it took our crews months and months of labor to repair that tunnel. That's the wall of the tunnel. And it's, uh, it's difficult work. We have dedicated uh, employees who are trained to work underground. Um, and some of this work you're seeing is, is just simply what it takes to maintain the system. Actually, I actually took that picture on the right, so I was really happy to see it included. Every time I'm down in the tun tunnels, I'm amazed at the work that happens down there all day, every day. So specifically, we need a parallel tunnel to serve uh, the entire central city system. It, it should be about four miles um, of, it's called downstream tunnel because it's collecting the rest. Um, and it will hopefully increase our capacity by about 300%. This slide is um, a little bit out of date. It's premature for us to show you our proposal for this year, but I wanted to show you an example of how we've planned for the project. Right now it is included in the city's pro forma and rate structure um, as an assumed cost, but we want to be able to provide relief to every rate payer by having assistance from state bonding. So in the $19 million request, that will hopefully be able to reduce the increase of rates significantly 
for every rate payer in the, in the city. The total cost is $38 million. A number of you have been down in the tunnels. We, we can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming down to see firsthand um, what the work is like and the importance of what happens down there and the importance of this project. And we hope that you will consider adding this again as a priority item for the city's bonding request. I will stand for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Um, Hutchison, <laughs> for that report. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Seeing none, I Thank think you. we will move. Thank you very much. To our next presentation. Next presentation is from the fire chief, Chief Freudel. We'll be talking about improvements to the emergency operation and fire training center uh, in Northeast Minneapolis, Fridley. Thank you. And we have received state funds and federal funds for this project over the last several years. Uh, Representative Ellison was able to get an earmark before earmarks went away. And Representative Dabney and I think it was Senator Dibble worked on uh, funding of uh, some additional funding for the uh, EOTF about five years ago. Wow, earmarks went away a while ago. That was, <laughs> that's a long process. Madam Chair, committee members, again, I'm uh, John Friedel, proud to say I'm the Chief of Minneapolis Fire Department. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Chief. Again, we're here today to talk about a project that has been on, in front of the committee, the bonding committee, uh, several times. It's a project that we've had, um, you know, on the list for probably four or five years. It's been a, it's been a challenge. I keep swinging, and, and we have a little bit of a miss every once in a while on the project. But what the project is really about is the final phase of enhancement of the EOTF training facility at, at the, uh, go ahead and click that at the um, EOTF. And it really is about the final phase of construction of the technical rescue um, training site or area in the, in the facility itself. And I'm kind of go off a little bit, but Minnesota Task Force One is, is a team that we are a member of, we meaning Minneapolis Fire Department. It, it's a state asset. And members of that team is Minneapolis, St. Paul, Edina, Dakota County, um, and also Rochester. Now there is some funding received from the state in regard to that team, but what we're getting into challenges when it comes into training of that team. Right now everything has to be done off-site. We use the facility um, to as a point of mobilization and a point of departure for that team. It's a highly trained technical rescue team in confined space, um, high angle rescue, uh, trench rescue, and even including water rescue. We just use that, that expertise yesterday at, during a, at the, uh, we removed a, a worker over at the public service center and so the team was over there uh, um, removing that, 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 uh, that worker. So it's a site and it's a facility that's used by a lot of people. And I'm going very quickly through this presentation, but I think that it's, uh, I think there's, I want to try to touch everything. But yeah, take your time. We want to know what other, I mean, what other um, municipalities or groups sure. are using these facilities. And I'll cover that. I will do. Thank you. You know, when it comes to just some examples of technical rescues that we've been, we've been a part of, obviously, Minnehaha Academy, the Minneapolis and Richfield border uh, natural gas explosion. Um, there's a, a, a picture of uh, depicts sort of the confined space training that our folks go through and this becomes very technical and it's way beyond the training of a, the typical scope of, of uh, standard firefighter training. They're highly trained team. We've been around for about 15 years. In Minneapolis, we have the heavy aspect of this team, which means we have a lot of equipment stored at the EOTF. And again, it's a point of mobilization, it's a point of departure. Um, I really would like to have this, this uh, project go through um, only because of the fact I would like to have our, our folks be able to train at the same site. Right now we've used, we've used uh, Camp Ripley up in Little Falls. We've used facilities outside the city. It's very inefficient. It's not very cost effective. Next slide. And we would, we would like to kind of bring that really, really in-house. Again, in terms of what we are trying to put together, be a, a, a structured rubble pile, a rack building, heavy lifting structure, and a, re a trench rescue structure. And there are some site renderings that you can see what this will look like. This will be located in the north end of our tr uh, present training facility. We've done some planning in the past of what that would look like. Next slide. Um, and again, it would be um, very effective, very efficient, um, and I think that we could also use city assets, could use the same site for their training, especially those who go below grade within the city. 
in front of you on, on the presentation, there is a list of, of current and regional, uh, regional uh, training facility users who use our facility. We are a very, very busy, busy facility, not only training our own firefighters, but you can see the list of other fire departments who do come in and, and presently use our, our facility. It's, a, it's probably one of the best facilities in the area. Uh, we would like to just enhance that a little bit and make it just that much better in terms of capa uh, capacity and capability. It's a total uh, projected cost, it's a $5 million project. That cost have been, have been fairly consistent over the last uh, five or six years since we put the project together. Next slide, there we go. Here's some of the, the, the pictures in the plan that we put together with the heavy lifting uh, part of the, of, the, um, of the site onto overall uh, site rendering of the entire site. You can see uh, there'd be a rubble pile on the left, a, a rack building on the, in the center, your heavy lifting on the far right, and then a trench rescue, and also uh, another uh, resettable training prop on the, um, on the center of the uh, uh, picture. You can go through the renderings here. You can see, get an idea what this would, this would uh, potentially look like when completed. All of these 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 um, structures are engineered to be used to be used to be resettable. They can be used for a number of years. It can be a, a facility that would be long lasting, be used long before I'm long after I'm gone. For the, the folks to still be using our technical rescue skills. That's one thing that is changing the fire service is the technical rescue aspect of what we do. That is something that has become very, um, it, it's much more needed than it probably used to be, and it's a very valued skill. Um, and we're proud to be part of Minnesota Task Force One, and we certainly are proud to be the Minneapolis Fire Department, and having the true um, facility that I think we need to have and be sort of that, that one facility where everybody wants to come to and, and train. We use it a lot now. Uh, it's very busy, and uh, that's the way it, it really should be. So I would appreciate any consideration and support of the project. And thank you, I'll be available for any questions. Thank you, Chief Brito. And, and as you mentioned, uh, Tuesday's rescue really highlighted, um, um, you know, the need for a, a state-of-the-art um, training facility. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? I'm, I'm curious how you're able to keep the cost estimates the same over five or six years, I think you mentioned, for a construction project, and yeah, we th if we you think have the answer, maybe CPED could figure out how to keep these uh, <laughs> cost estimates down as well. <laughs> it's a uh, creative partnership, so, you know, we have to be, you know, certainly involve our, our partner, you know, uh, corporate partners in this project, and there's these things that we have to we realize there's a responsibility to do that, and we try to do that, and, and uh, that's what we plan to plan for, and I think we're very consistent in that, in that, in that, in that cost area. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, that concludes the presentations on the three projects and the resolution before you. I uh, would recommend that we delete um, line four or number four and then we then would have to have this resolution because it has to be submitted as part of our proposals to the governor's office the legislation requires if you do more than one project you have to set priorities thank you mr ranieri and with that i would like to move the resolution i believe that all my colleagues have before them um and note that item number four um, has been deleted from this resolution. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, um, I will uh, ask that all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. And that item carries. And our next discussion item, we will go back to the original item number one, which is um, state, local, and federal updates.
Madam Chair, how much time do we have? We, we could spend 45 minutes on this, but we can do it also in about 10 or 15. Is that right? I, I think that is up to the will of the body. Okay. Uh, somewhere in between okay. uh, those two uh, parameters you set. Okay. Madam Chair and members, you know that legislative session started in January. It ended officially on May 20th. However, since not all the work was done, uh, there was a special session on May 28th. Uh, that session was over, started sometime early, around noonish. It ended four, five, six o'clock the next morning. Uh, all the bills that were omnibus bills, that were those transportation and finance and all the appropriation bills, all but one were in special session. The only one that was passed in the regular session was higher education. Uh, many elements, many policy elements were put into the omnibus bills. Unfortunately, many of those policy issues came from the House. The Senate wasn't as interested in policy issues, so many of those were dropped. And as we go through the presentation, you'll see what was added and what was dropped from the, present, from the bills. Uh, what we'd like to do is, uh, we're going to do this in three parts, the updates, outstanding issues, and believe it or not, looking forward to 2020. We're going to start the process in two weeks with our state, city departments to get ready for the uh, start on February 11th, 2020 at noon. Well, this was a budget year, and we did have the, the vital legislature. Uh, we're going to focus on those pri uh, priority areas that were part of our agenda and try and uh, summarize what happened. In the area of public finance, most of it was in the tax bill, which became chapter six. The LGA is a big issue for all cities. Uh, for our city, I think we get around $79 million a year. Uh, the governor proposed a $30 million increase for each year of the biennium. Uh, the, actually what happened is a $26 million increase for the first year of the biennium, and then an additional $4 million for the second uh, part of the biennium second year of the biennium, which would give us the 30, the 30 of the year two. There, were, there was no change and no change at all in the formula, but lots of discussion about the formula, and there could be some work done over the summer. Some cities are concerned that they go on and off the formula. Others think they don't get enough money. Others believe that they've never been on the formula and maybe there should be some sort of base amount. So all of those types of bills were discussed this session, but there was no change in the formula. The House decided to wait with the Senate and maybe work over the summer or next year. The uh, increase for the city is $2 million, so we'd have an $81 million LGA uh, total uh, going forward. In terms of one of the issues we've worked on for the last couple of years has been the lodging tax. As you're aware, we are the only city in the state with a cap. Uh, if someone else raises their, their taxes for lodging, a sales tax or a special tax, if it goes over a total of 13%, our lodging tax goes down. Right now, our lodging tax is at 2.125%. By statute, we can be at 3%, and before 2008, you, your predecessors adopted a 3% lodging tax. We are right now are about number four or five in terms of who has from high to low in terms of lodging taxes. We're about the fifth highest rate in the state. What this bill did is, allowed, is basically said, we can go to 3%, and if we wanted to go higher, we have to go back to the legislature, which is basically current law. The Senate wanted a cap, so we drafted a cap that really wasn't a cap. And that three million, that three, that percent is something that you would need to decide as, as a city council to raise the rate to whatever from 2.125 as the max would be 3%. Uh, the Upper Harbor Terminal, TIF District was included in there. And I want to give a shout out, well, no one's here from the CPED, but the presentation was well received. And the Senate is particularly in the Senate. Uh, the MRF, and we have, every year we have a, a discussion on MRF for the legislature. The governor did propose to uh, restore funding for MRF at the level it had been for several years, having a split where $16 million would come from the state and $21 million annually would come from the employers, ourselves, the park board, the uh, school board, and several other entities who had people working in MRF before 1980. Uh, that what happened is it's, it's been extended now uh, for at least this biennium and the next biennium. 
So MRF would be an item where we would have less, to, we'd have less to contribute for the next couple of years, and I think our total of that 10 is probably around six million dollars. This year we were, we were contributing the employers 31 million, and I think our contribution is about 12 million. And also other provisions where the, uh, the as part of the minimum wage study, minimum wage ordinance, you directed this. Uh, a study to be done about the economic impact of minimum wage. And the uh, Federal Reserve came forward and said they would like to do that and work with us, and they would do it, I think, at no cost. They needed some language to protect them, protect the data being transferred from DOR to them. And after lots of uh, work, it was approved, and it was also in the tax bill. So we can go forward with the study. Uh, there's also tax conformity uh, from the, to the federal law. Remember again, last year, we didn't have a tax bill, we didn't have conformity. So our tax next year, income tax will now conform with, mostly with the feds. Uh, the provider tax, which was a major issue during the discussion of this session, uh, is now, it's not no longer sunsetted, but it's at 1.8% instead of 2%. The uh, property tax for the, collected by the state, on commercial industrial property was also reduced by $47 million or 5%. So some of the industrial properties, commercial industrial properties in our city will see a reduction in their total property tax from the state. The second tier of the state income tax was lowered by the Senate and approved and agreed to by the House from 7.05% to 6.8%, and it shows the tier. So it covers a pretty long spectrum of folks from whose income as low as 25,000 to as high as 147,000. So it really didn't get down to the low, really low, low income folks. Not included was the uh, PERA retirement aid that's been paid since 1997. Uh, it was not, it was sunset, none of us caught it. So we have to come back next year. That's about a loss of $500,000 to the city. Uh, the House proposed a tax, property tax refund for both uh, rental and home ownership, but they were not included in the final bill. Representative Loffer really worked hard on this issue as chair of that division. Uh, the Class 4D property tax class rate reductions or the study of the Class 4D did not occur. 4D is the tax rate applied to low income rental housing, and uh, it was not changed. I think right now it's 0.75 and 0.25. And uh, so we're going to have to maybe work over the summer on this issue. And then the uh, Senate proposal to, to have a prohibition, this was basically a preemption in the tax bill on city or county fees or taxes on food containers did not make it into the final bill. Madam Chair, I can move on to pensions uh, quickly. We have an off Minnesota has a statute that says if you're over 62, you can retire and come back and work for the city for a, up to a year at half time, a thousand hours. And in the purpose of this legislation, which was passed about five or six years ago, was to allow for a transition for someone who has a, may have a lot of institutional knowledge, technology, or other technical skills, to transfer that technology, education, and skills onto the people who are taking that position. Uh, we've done it with a couple of our employees. I think we had about 26 people who have used it so far. There seems to be a lot of interest in this. It was extended, the sunset was removed, and you can enter into five one-year agreements. And most people do about a one-year. And we will probably see some folks, because I got, was getting phone calls from city employees asking me when it would occur, and our response was, wait till May. Uh, the, uh, also, uh, something that was also in the pension bill was we had a police and fire closed pension funds, and we merged them into PERA back in 2010, 2011. Every year we were to make a contribution to keep those funds uh, to pay our obligations. It also suggested that when there was a change in the interest rate, statutory interest rate uh, for pensions, there'd be an adjustment. We were concerned that those adjustments may have not every, added everything in or considered every item like interest earnings or in, rate of interest actually in the market, things of that nature. So over the summer between ourselves, uh, PERA and the uh, and PERA, we were and representatives of police and fire, we were able to come up with an agreement where we would basically have a flat amount from now to 2031, regardless of what happens in the interest rate, paid by the city. And it's about six million dollars less than we're doing annually, so there is a savings there for the city. 
climate and energy. I think this is one of the biggest, bigger disappointments of the session. Uh, the House had numerous provisions in their bill. The Senate didn't have much. What we wound up is, uh, as you can see on the screen, lots of uh, studies, particularly on battery storage and energy storage. And you can see what wasn't in the bill was a thing. One of the items that our folks from sustainability worked on was the 100% carbon free energy by possibly 2050. And one of the things they were really active in was the authority of local governments to accept or to adopt 2030 building standards. Uh, Representative Long was the champion on this one. Hopefully over the summer we can pop possibly work something out for 2020. 2020. Uh, and the environment and natural resources, uh, we did have a settlement a couple, a couple years ago uh, with Northern Metals where we received some funding. Uh, Representative Lee and others were able to get an additional $200,000 uh, out of the environmental fund transferred to the Department of Health to be used uh, for implementing the, the recommendations of the advisory task force. Our health department's talking to the Minnesota Department of Health to see how this is going to work. But it would produce more funding for uh, enhanced blood testings and uh, asthma screening and things of that nature. We also see uh, more money going into SCORE, which is the uh, recycling facility for facilities for, uh, excuse me, recycling grants for counties. It was only a $500,000 increase each year, and that program has been woefully underfunded for years. There's also uh, two things went to PCA. One was a $750,000 grant to PCA for uh, reducing and diverting food waste, uh, the concern about how that gets into composting and organics. And half of that, or about, excuse me, half a million of that has to be used in trying to reduce waste, food waste. The 400,000 was uh, the PCA to possibly for grants to help develop recycling industry, businesses in our own city, given what's happening in the international trade issues, uh, we're seeing many, many of our things that were recycled in other parts of the world not going there. So uh, there's, the legislature was aware of that and put some money down for at least starting the whole idea of how can we entice industries to work in our city or state in terms of recycling. The other it, interesting issue, uh, it's called No Child Left Inside Grant Program. This is a program that I think is going to work closely with education facilities where People, young children, uh, youth, who may be coming from inner city neighborhoods or low income neighborhoods could learn more about outdoors, the science, uh, the ecology, not hunting or fishing, but more about what's happening in the environment, water quality, things of that nature. DNR is going to be doing that. It's a brand new program, and we'll, we'll watch it to see if there's anything to happen in our city. The Met Council got $8 million for uh, the regional park operations. And that money, some of that money by a formula, goes to our park board. And part of the money comes from general fund, and part of it comes from the DNR funds, which uh, was something that we didn't do for years. So, the, so there's about $8 million over the, each year uh, for uh, operations and maintenance of, of regional parks. In legacy, which is uh, the re revenues coming from the t extra tax that was passed in 2008 uh, for, uh, for the sales tax, and there are four major funds. Uh, the total biennial appropriation for those funds is about $630 million. Uh, part of it uh, is for the water fund, and in the water fund, about $1.7 million each year, the biennial has been used to be used for Te it's testing surface water quality. Uh, there are 25 uh, communities in the state, including ourselves, St. Paul and St. Cloud, who draw water from either lakes, like Lake Superior or other local lakes, or from rivers. We, do, we draw from the Mississippi. There's some concern, particularly by Representative Wagenius, that that water, uh, what's the quality of that water? And before it's finished and even after it's finished, is there, you know, is it safe? So uh, we're going to be looking at that. That's, come, that's going to be going to the Department of Health. Also some money went to the Met Council. There's also uh, money for uh, regional park development and land acquisition. And again, there's a formula in distribution. And again, our park board will be receiving some of those funds for the development and acquisition of parkland. I can stop for any questions at any time. Uh, in capital investment, one way to say it best, nothing happened. The House was working on a bill. The Senate never introduced anything. 
and nothing happened. And it was really a big disappointment. I'll turn it over to my colleagues and I'll stop for a question. Council President Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. This might not be a simple question, but um, how do you anticipate that changing anything about next session, which would normally have been more of a sort of policy focus year, having not had a bonding bill passed, do you think? Yeah. I, I, um, and Madam Chair, Council President Bender, next year is a bonding year, and we are going to be pushing along with others for the uh, ABRTs, particularly the D line. And I know that's one of the issues that was discussed this session. We, I think uh, Council Member Johnson testified in support of that at a bonding bill. We all, we all that testified worked on that. So we, I think we're going to see a bonding bill next year. The governor's starting the process. And you know, how big it will be will be the question. But uh, I think it's in fact that we had a bill in 18, no bill in 19, and a bill in 20, which is basically the tradition. It used to be the legislature never did a bill in an even year. In the last couple of years, they did it in an even year. And sometimes they do it in an even year when they don't do a bill for two years in a row to try to catch up. But I think it'll be a bonding bill in 2020. I mean, everyone's thinking about it and we're getting ready for it. Good afternoon, Chair Jenkins, um, committee members. My name is Allison Nessie, Government Relations Representative. Um, I will start our Health and Human Services. Uh, as, as we've brought you along on this journey throughout session, the House came in with big proposals and the Senate came in with significantly less. So the debate, particularly in the Health and Services um, Conference community, Committee, was um, thorough. So as far as the priorities for the city, um, there were no changes to the local public health grants. The House had proposed an increase to that. The Senate did not. Um, the biggest compromise, per, kind of the biggest compromise of the Senate GOP caucus was um, to agree to remove the sunset of the provider tax, even though it decreased from 2% to 1.8%. Um, as Jean mentioned, it is in the tax bill, but that provider tax um, funds the health care access fund, which supports a lot of activities that uh, trickle down to the city and our residents. Um, in, also in the HHS bill, the MFIP, um, Minnesota Families Investment Program stipend was increased by $100 a month. Um, this program had not seen an increase since 1986. Uh, reinsurance uh, continued for the biennium. Around, there was a lot of tobacco legislation introduced in the House. Um, the only provision to make it through into the final bill was including um, e-cigarettes into the Clean Indoor Air Act. Um, something that is new as well, hmm, I'm incorrect, sorry. There was a 4.35 uh, million appropriation uh, for this tobacco cessation line and cessation efforts uh, statewide. The bill also establishes a working group to examine the links between health disparities and educational achievement for children of color and ind indigenous children, which was chief authored by uh, Representative Daphne from the Minneapolis delegation. Some provisions that we worked extensively on that were not included um, in particular were the Tobacco 21. Uh, Shameful. Which was, oh. mm -hmm. um, it was included in the House uh, bill, but was not included in the Senate and did not make it into the final. Um, the asthma care services benefit, extending um, medical assistance to cover asthma mitigation products. Uh, was included in the House bill, which is great. Um, we, in the past, we've gotten hearings, but not been in the bill. We've been in the bill, but this was, so we're gonna see it as a positive and um, opportunity for next year, um, but it was not included in the final, and the ban on conversion therapy was not included. Alrighty, Chair Jenkins and council members, my name is Parker Bennett. I'm the legislative aide for IGR this session. I'm gonna divert us a little bit from the budget bills and go to 
the opioid epidemic response bill that was passed this year in the regular session. Um, it had two main components. The first was establishing an opioid epidemic response advisory council. Um, its mission would be to develop and implement a comprehensive and effective statewide effort to address the opioid addiction and overdose epidemic in Minnesota. It's consisted of 19 voting members and three non-voting members. Those three non-voting are the commissioners of health, human services, and public safety. Um, they would be tasked with reviewing initiatives and best practices, establishing priorities um, and grant criteria, and then developing measurable outcomes for the grants that they would be overseeing and recommending. Um, the next would be to establish an opioid, opioid product registration fee or an OPR. Uh, this would be on both distributors and manufacturers of more than two million units, which they define in statute as a single dose, like a pill or a patch. Um, they would be uh, paying a fee of $250,000 each year, um, plus a licensure fee of $55,000, so that'd be $305,000 a year. Um, for those that do not um, do more at or more than two million units, it would be just a licensure fee of five thousand dollars, which is raised from uh, anywhere from one eighty to two twenty currently. Um, this would sunset if the state recovered more than two hundred and fifty million dollars in settlement um, from various uh, ongoing litigation proceeds, um, but only after five years of this program as it stands right now. Um, they would be deposited into a new opioid epidemic response account and from that about $7.8 million in grants uh, distributed by the council and then $7.8 million uh, to reimburse counties and tribal governments for child protection costs related to families disrupted by the opioid epidemic. Questions? Is there, is there a lawsuit? by the Attorney General um, yes. to medical manufacturers? Yeah. Madam uh, Chair, it's my understanding that we are we did file a lawsuit, and I think we're in partnership with other states also in lawsuits. And some states have settled. I think Oklahoma settled a couple months ago. And I know there's some ongoing cases right now. But yeah, we, we are involved in a lawsuit, the state. Do you know if if successful, would those funds go to that um, fund? Yes, so any settlement funds would go into that fund and they'd be statutorily uh, directed to the opioid response uh, activities that are set out under the council. So they wouldn't be able to be used for anything other than opioid response. Thank you. Uh, they also included some other provisions in the bill, um, including allowing people to uh, include in their health care directives that they don't want to be prescribed opioids, um, some alternative me methods of drug disposal uh, for sheriffs, um, expanded photo ID requirements for purchasing, as well as a one-month time limit on fills and refills of prescriptions, as well as establishing a seven-day quantity limits for adults uh, after major trauma or surgical procedures. Um, they would only be given a seven-day uh, prescription afterwards and would have to have that renewed. Um, they also uh, required continuing education on anyone that has a license to prescribe opioids and they would have to go through a two-hour course um, on best practices. And then it also expanded the amount of people that are authorized to administer uh, naloxone, the anti, the opioid antagonist that's used to uh, prevent overdoses. Next, we have the Jobs and Economic Development Bill, which was Chapter 7 of the special session. It appropriated around $11 million from the general fund and $43 million from the Workforce Development Fund for a job. Uh, employment and training programs uh, administered by DEED. Um, it also included three major policy changes. The first would be regarding wage theft. It enhanced penalties for wage theft and also gave uh, enhanced and broad enforcement authority to the Attorney General and DALI, um, as well as required employers to give notice to employees on what their wage would be, uh, as well as payment schedules. 
Um, there's also a policy regarding retainage for public projects, um, basically requiring payment to contractors and subcontractors within a certain period of time, giving subcontractors the ability to request information from the primary agent about when the primary contractor was paid, um, as well as some other changes. And then they created a new airport infrastructure renewal grant program, which would be uh, providing funds to cover up to 50% of new capital costs for either redevelopment or uh, new construction for airport facilities. And that would include infrastructure. Um, notably, you'll see that preemption of local minimum wage ordinances as proposed by the Senate were not included, as well as house proposals for paid family and medical leave, which would have employees and employers pay into a fund that would then be used to provide paid family and medical leave for uh, workers across the state, as well as requiring earned sick and safe time. Um, those were not in the final bill and did not get passed. And then moving to judiciary and public safety, this is another bill that's kind of uh, more of what was not included. What was included was a increase over the base of 124 roughly million dollars. They moved the Peace Officer Standards and Training Board or Post Board funding from the Special Revenue Fund to the General Fund. That now sits at $20.6 million roughly. They also established a task force on missing and murdered indigenous women that would look at the systemic causes, best practices and policies on how to address it and uh, provide a report to the legislature by, I believe, the end of 2020. Um, it also had some uh, policy about expanding classifications of rideshare and transit da data to cover all government entities. Right now it's uh, very specific in statute as to what government entities that covers. Um, also some requirements for firefighter certification and employment eligibility, and it would also require 911 dispatchers be trained in how to give CPR instructions over the phone. Things that were not included in this omnibus bill this year were gun safety provisions, notably a expanded background check bill and extreme risk protection orders, also known as uh, the red flag bill. Uh, these were not included. Um, as well as the restoration of the right to vote for uh, people that have concluded their sentence of incarceration. Um, this, along with any election provisions, were not included in the Judiciary and Public Safety Bill this year, uh, mostly due to the Senate position. Uh, driver's license fines and fees suspension reform was also not included. Ultimately, this faced um, uh, issues with the uh, fiscal note and then also no cannabis related provisions were included and this includes setting up a task force to study uh, what recreational marijuana would look like in the state as well as expanding and uh, establishing uh, recreational marijuana and then expanding the current medical uh, marijuana program. One of the bills uh, that one of the last bills that passed was a state government operations bill. Uh, there was major differences when these bills both went to conference committee. The House bill included lots of provisions dealing with employees, state employees, and the Senate bill, uh, and also the House bill included an awful lot of election law activities and other provisions dealing with some human rights issues. Uh, the Senate bill was not like that. The Senate bill was very thin. Uh, it basically cut their, they actually reduced their, their uh, budget uh, for state agencies while the House did not. Uh, what they did come out with at the end was a couple items. They established a legislative commission on housing affordability. This is going to be a eight member for all legislators, House and Senate members, four from each, two from each caucus. They're supposed to issue a report, define what housing affordability is, and they're supposed to finish their work by 2023. That's when they go away. So it'll be interesting to see when these folks start and when they get appointed. Another one is a million point six dollars to implement uh, outreach and mobilization for the census. This was in the Senate, in the House bill, excuse me. And this would go grants to uh, 
uh, full, full count uh, committees throughout the state to make sure we get the number of people counted right. And this money should be going through the Department of Administration and or the uh, Minneapolis Foundation within the next couple of weeks. Uh, the help I just want to just comment that um, there was just a report out that um, is projecting that this could potentially be the lowest census turnout in several decades. And so um, this, this funding from the state, as well as our efforts here in the city and coordinating with other municipalities is going to be critical to us, um, you know, getting the, the resources that we need, but also to maintaining a congressional seat. Uh, so um, we have a pretty robust um, plan here uh, in the city, but we are going to need support from the state and the broader metropolitan area too. So th this money should be available uh, soon, and uh, it will. It was earmarked for the whole get out the get out the people to get the right count on the census. Mm -hmm. uh, the help the Help America Vote Act funding was tied up for a couple of years. We, I think we were the last state to actually approve the funding and transfer it into an account where it can be used and the activities that it be used for would be cybersecurity, uh, security in general, things of that nature. That $6.5 million, $6.59 million, I uh, hope was really important for uh, getting ready for the next election. And it was freed up. It was not in the House bill, but excuse me, not in the Senate bill, but in the House bill. And then another provision, uh, data that's going to be used, collected uh, during the presidential primary preference uh, that's going to be done next year. Uh, it was originally thought that you, uh, my preference, your preference for what party and would all become public data. It is now private data, but it can be, if I understand it correctly, can be given to the directors of the four major parties who are... Uh, be contesting next year. So stay tuned for more activity there. Uh, in housing. So housing, um, the House, their bill uh, brought in before conference committee $26 million increase to various programs administered by the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Um, and the Senate came in with a zero target. So they compromised at $15 million um, for the programs listed below, uh, $5 million for in one time funding for the challenge, challenge grant program, which um, supports a lot of our supportive and affordable housing developments, two million for manufactured home park infrastructure, 500,000 for the bridges, which is rental assistance um, for individuals living with a mental illness, um, 3.5 million increase for family homelessness prevention and assistance program, um, 3.5 million for homework starts with home, which aligns really well with the city's um, stable homes, stable schools program, so that's um, very good for the city. And then $500,000 for workforce um, home ownership. Also in the HHS bill, but um, not reflected on the slides, there was a three million dollar one-time appropriation to the emergency um, services program which supports um, emergency shelter services operation and is really flexible so that was good news um, because there was not a bonding bill um, their last bill passed this session was a $60 million bill for housing infrastructure bonds. Um, housing infrastructure bonds are appropriation bonds, not general obligation bonds, so they didn't need to be included in the bonding bill. They could pass on a simple majority, not a super majority that a bonding bill needs. Um, so that is, that is a positive outcome, one, um, if we didn't have a bonding bill. Excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, Councilman Administrator. So I just wanted to follow up. Is that kind of the thinking why there was no GO bonds in there just because of the vote count or vote vote that was needed? Correct. That's about it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, a, because they would need parties' uh, votes from the minority party. They didn't really speak publicly as to why it didn't come together in the end, but. I'm just trying to get an <laughs> idea of what we're in store for next year. Thanks. Okay. 
Um, so yes, both House and Senate will need to um, have six or seven members from the minority uh, voting in the final bill. Um, so that was our uh, Excuse me, Ms. Yeah. Uh, yes. Council President Bender. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thought maybe it was worth uh, mentioning here um, that in addition to really advocating for this, especially the um, homelessness prevention assistance funding and mm -hmm. um, in particular, um, the, the Lieutenant Governor is convening a statewide partnership focused on unsheltered homelessness which had existed in the last administration, but has really, um, I think, blossomed under the new Wells Flanagan administration and the council vice president and I are there along with the mayor on behalf of the city um, and the city of St. Paul and then the seven counties in the metro region. And so there's a real concerted effort to put together a regional funding strategy for temporary shelter and the services that go along with that. And I think having the state also put in millions of dollars toward um, temporary shelter is really meaningful as we try to figure out how to get the beds in place that we really need to address staggering increases in homelessness. We heard just at the meeting earlier this week that in addition to the 10% increase in people experiencing homelessness statewide that our region saw a 55% increase just in the last year. Um, and so just really extraordinary large numbers of people who um, our, our system is just not designed yet to be able to provide the beds that we need. And so I um, thought it was worth mentioning as part of this piece. And of course, I mean, the the funding for permanent affordable housing is, is what's really needed. So it's so exciting to see this. And really, I think it was nothing short of a miracle to get this through <laughs> this session. Um, so it's, it's really exciting to see, as you said, along with all the efforts that the city is putting forward to fund shelter, housing, supportive housing, all of that. So. Any more questions on the appropriation side? Um, on the policy side, as I've been updating you throughout, um, most of the controversial or proposed policies from the Senate that would have negatively impacted the work of the cities were not included. Um, included were the removal of the restrictions passed in the 2018 um, bill on MHFA regarding their qualified action plan terms. It removed the um, per unit um, maximum that um, housing per unit, the per unit maximum for housing tax for tax credits. Um, around there was a proposal to explicitly have MHFA split. Um, grants and loans 50-50 between Metro and Greater Minnesota. The final language is a bit softer. Um, it's to the extent practicable, practicable to award grants and loans with a reasonable balance between non-metropolitan and metropolitan areas of the state. Um, workforce and affordable housing, it expands the program to include cities um, and tribal governments as grantees. Around the Minnesota Bond Allocation Act, it includes the five consensus items that were recommendations from the Tax Exempt Bond Steering Committee, as well as one conference committee compromise. Um, and I know we've talked about this in Council Member Schrader, it was concerned, um, that reduced the amount of the reservation in the housing pool for single family housing programs from 31 to 27%. So a 4% decrease, the original proposal was to have completely eliminate it. Um, so this was the compromise. Around landlord-tenant um, provisions, the only one to prevail was requiring um, written leases for all um, rental units with 12 units or more. Um, they need to have specific specifics about the unit occupied, the amount of prorated rent if applicable, and the lease um, start and end date have to be on the lease. It also provides for the same um, time period notices to quit a lease for both the landlord and the tenant. Um, and the last thing is there was a bit of added language around manufactured homes and parks. Excuse me, yep. Council President Binder. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've mentioned this uh, every time we talk about this, but I do want to flag that um, I think there's actually significant leadership within our delegation on the um, renter protection um, policies that didn't 
um, didn't make it through this session and a lot of opportunity to build support across the region as we look to the next session, frankly, across the state. Um, so it's something that I really want to prioritize, you know, for myself, and I think something that um, elected leaders in Minneapolis could um, help, you know, reaching out to our colleagues through the various um, partnerships that we are a part of, so that as we go into the next session, we are arming um, ourselves with with broader support across the state. And I think, again, it's some of these changes that were proposed this session, I think are very common sense, moderate proposals that if we had the time to build support would, would be welcomed across the state. Things even as simple as, you know, written notification that your rent is due, or, you know, pay or quit, policies they're called, but they're essentially just saying, you know, hey, if you don't pay me $300, you'll be evicted by the state. I mean, pr pretty simple things that most states have. And that honestly would go a very long way to helping, I think, stem the tide of this rising homelessness that we are seeing. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. But I'm excited to continue to build support for those changes and appreciate the work that went in this session with so many other priorities happening. No, we hear you. And shout out to our Minneapolis delegation who carried all but one of the landlord tenant bills. Um, and real quick on transportation, um, a lot that didn't happen to summarize it um, briefly. Uh, as far as impacts to the city, there was a $32 million increase to municipal state aid. The city receives about 2.8 per biennium, so that's about 1.4 increase per year. There's an increase to the um, trunk highway corridor and bridge improvement studies, um, 104.8 million to the Trunk Highway Fund. Um, as far as Metro Transit, they did split the operations of Metro Transit and Metro Mobility into two different line items. Um, Metro Transit therefore took, received 47.8 million less in operations than they did in the previous biennium, um, but they are given the ability to um, issue general obligation bonds for capital improvements um, at the amount of 92.3 million. Um, Metro Mobility received an increase of 23.19 and they uh, received service expansion to Lakeville. And then there's 26.7 million in the local bridge, um, local bridge fund. Many um, of the policy provisions and new revenue, um, suggested new revenue sources that were not included proposed by the House. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Policies. <laughs> um, one of the biggest successes, personally, uh, was the city speed limits. Um, we were successful in getting the ability to re reduce our speed limits on residentially zoned roads um, to 25 miles per hour on all other arterial and um, roads in commercial zoned areas. We'll need to do a bit more work around a, saf a safety study, engineering, and traffic analysis. Um, and this applies to all cities across um, the state. The Met Council and DHS can now share um, information around um, people using their services. Um, the MnDOT will be able to accept applications for platooning. There are changes to zoning requirements around airport property, which align with work that we already do. And the city um, is now statutorily required to hold one annual meeting around uh, rail safety during Southwest Light Rail construction. Um, policies that were not included in the transportation bill are the driver's licenses for all, um, the driver's license suspension um, and revocation reform, which mirrored the, the bill and language included in the public safety bill that was also not included. Um, the transfer of the Stone Arch Bridge from MnDOT to the city was not included. A prohibition on bike lanes um, that would displace disability parking spots was not included. We'll be working with the disability community over the summer to um, come to a compromise on that. Um, the House had introduced language around environment and climate reporting um, by MnDOT to the legislature. Um, that was not included. And electric vehicle infrastructure requirements were not included. What we've discussed a lot throughout session are the proposed, what were the proposed um, increases to existing revenue sources, including um, 
all of these listed on the slide were not included in the final omnibus. The 20 cent increase um, to the fuel tax phased in over four years, an increase to the motor vehicle registration tax, an increase to the motor vehicle sales tax, a new half cent sales tax in the seven county metro, which would have gone to the Transportation Advisory Board and the Met Council, $2 billion in trunk highway bond operations over eight years, and the increase to Met Transit and funding for arterial bus rapid transit. Um, all of these were not included. Turn it over to Jean. Council President Bender. I promise they'll be very brief. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do, you know, I will say that of the tragedy of transportation funding of this session, at least we didn't get a situation where roads were funded without transit, because that is an unrecoverable scenario for the city of Minneapolis and those across our region that are dependent on transit and who have, like we have, um, really started to, to guide growth near transit. Like the transit part is really important. So while I think we should all feel sad and bad or <laughs> you know about what happened, at least we have the opportunity again in the next session to make the case for both and to make sure that transit isn't getting left behind, which at some points during the session seemed possible and made me very nervous. And I think, again, like with housing, I think we have such a talented delegation representing the city of Minneapolis in both the House and Senate. And I think to the extent that the city can really lift up their leadership and make sure that we are helping um, you know, develop the leadership of multiple um, folks in our in our delegation to really advocate for their constituents, especially those who represent those wards that are so transit de or districts that are so transit mm -hmm. dependent. Mm -hmm. I think there's again a lot of opportunity for us to partner together with um, those other elected officials and really make the case. So I think all is not lost quite yet, or I don't know. There's a silver line. I don't know what kind of <laughs> give us a parable, Mr. Ranieri. <laughs> but I, you know, hope hope for next session. You know, I would just speak to that briefly, um, Madam President. Um, just this past uh, week, I hosted a, um, a legislative session, and we had both the House Chair and the, the Senate um, Chair of the Transportation Committees um, present, and, and we discussed this very same issue and how we can work together, how we can be more supportive, how we can um, really, I think, put pressure on some of those in our delegation that don't necessarily um, <laughs> represent transit-dependent districts to also become more vocal on this, this issue. So I, I really support your, um, your statements and thought process and um, and and it's never too early to begin that conversation, Mr. Ranieri. Ma Madam, uh, Madam Chair, Council President Bender, thanks for that comment. That really made my day in a sense that you know we, could, we basically no one really won on transportation, bridges and highways. You look at the numbers, way low, and. Uh, and for transit, you know, low also. So we both have something we can work for next year. And, and our delegation, we're lucky to have the chair in the House, Representative Hornstein, the minority leads, Senator Dibble. And then we have many members of our delegation who are supportive of funding for and development of transit. So the last slide basically talks about what we've been talking about all day. So we're going to start soon. We're going to go hopefully meet with all council members about what happened this year, and then also ask them for help for next year, what they would like to see as priorities and where, where to go next. We're going to also be spending some time with the League of Cities and Metro Cities on their policy committees. We have found it to be very helpful when we're trying to push some issues like, this, like transportation and transit, and also housing. And then there will be some interim projects. I know some of the committees, uh, Representative Wolgini has uh, mentioned at that meeting that the council, the council Vice President just mentioned, she's going to be having some field hearings, particularly on water quality, and there will probably be a few more. I've heard uh, Representative Loeffler talk about the possibilities from discussion about property taxes and housing. So we'll thank you for your attention. I know we went a little longer, but we really appreciate the dialogue and questions, and thank you very much. You know, I just want to say thank you, Mr. Ranieri, to you and your staff for um, an amazing um, session, and though we did not um, get all the things that we wanted, um, it certainly did bring some 
uh, positive news to the city of Minneapolis. And, um, and all of this was done in the midst of lots of transitions and turnover and um, shorthandedness. Um, and so my commendations and, and just great appreciation to you and your uh, team for um, representing the city extremely well in this uh, tough legislative session. People who worked with me during the session, Ms. Nessie and Mr. Uh, Bennett, mm -hmm. uh, they had little or no experience, but before the session was over, they were grizzled veterans. Yeah, and thank they're, you. They're, they're pros as, as, uh, as demonstrated in their presentations today. So thank you. And I did want to correct my statement. The, the event that um, happened last weekend was co-hosted by myself and Council Member Schrader. So thank you, uh, Council Member Schrader. And seeing no further business before this committee, we are adjourned.